Hey, how's it going? Today we're going to install Arch Linux in a VirtualBox virtual machine. So this is just going to be a bare bones Arch Linux install. I'm going to use the LXDE lightweight desktop environment for Linux. And that's it. So it's going to be a machine that will be pretty stripped down but have just the core features you might expect like if you did a stripped down install with the graphical interface and everything and then you'll probably get just enough knowledge from doing this to s expand the system however you want dig into the wiki all that kind of stuff all right so without further ado let's get started so right here this is a, I'll put this link below the video on YouTube it's a link right now I have it as a gist on github but I'll probably move it into a more like official folder or whatever but this link right here at the top will take you to the installation guide on Arch Linux's wiki and this link right here will of course give you the image to download so I've already downloaded the image but it's just an ISO file and I don't think, I think it's just like a CD-ROM size. It's not like a uh, DVD size or anything. So what we'll want to do is once we download and install this ISO or download it, we need to install it, mount it in here. So I'm opening up VirtualBox. If you don't have it, go download it from virtualbox.org. And you won't obviously have all these virtual machines down the side here right right now if you have a fresh start going. So... I do whatever no big deal so all I have to do is go here and click new or you can go to machine new and then I'm gonna name it arch and it automatically detects I'm talking about arch Linux probably 64-bit yeah it gives us a gigabyte of memory which is pretty good if you're just gonna do like a console install you could get a lot done with a gigabyte but I'm gonna go ahead and bump it up to two gigs of memory and then I'm gonna make sure create a virtual hard disk now is checked and I'm going to I'm not going to click guided mode. I'm just going to click create. Um, <laughs> that's really weird that it won't let me create the virtual machine there. I just did not too long ago. Okay, so let me copy that and uh Open a command prompt. Oops. Oh wow, it still has that old command in there, huh? Anyway, I don't know what's going on with that. That's some glitch in their system. So what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to cancel this. And if I just go down here to like one of these other sections, like I could even probably click an Android on mine. This is a virtual box glitch that probably doesn't even exist on other versions. I'm going to click new. And do the same thing. Arch. Once again, it detected all that. I'm going to bump it up to 2 gigs of RAM again. Create virtual hard disk. Click create. Oh, hey, what do you know? It's letting me do it now. Um, if you're doing the graphical user interface, I'd recommend at least 8 gigs. I want to say the install after we're done the way we do it is plus or minus 4 gigs. Maybe less. Um, and so 8 gigs would give you just a few gigabytes of wiggle room. But we're going to use this dynamically allocated VDI disk. And so what that will do is even if we set it to like 32 gigs or whatever, it will only use as much as it needs before it grows on your host system. But once it does grow, you have to take a couple extra steps of deleting stuff and then running some commands to like shrink it back down. So that's kind of the catch with that. But anyway, I'm just going to bump it up to 16 and hit create. All right, now if I look down here, I've got my Arch machine powered off. I'm going to right-click it and hit Settings, which you can also do right there if it's highlighted, of course. And then for General, I'm going to leave all that the same. Oh, go ahead and click the Advanced tab over here. And for Shared Clipboard, I'll put it on Bidirectional. That won't work right out of the gate, which is kind of a bummer because we have to do a lot of extra typing, but oh well. One of the cool things with Linux is if you've used it a lot, especially at the command line, it's sort of, for me, it gets me in the mode where I just start typing. And even though I'm like typing more overall, I get so used to typing that 
it it just becomes like second nature all over again to where it's not that big of a deal even though i'm typing way more than i usually do on like a windows system it's almost like a burden on windows because i feel like i type so much less that it's like no longer in my wheelhouse at the moment anyway yeah shared bidirectional clipboard system um we can uncheck floppy if we want no big deal still has the two gigs of memory i'd probably leave all this the same just the defaults. He usually picks sensible defaults on modern stuff. Processors, I'm going to go ahead and bump that up to a dual core. I have four cores in my system. And this enable PAX and this nested virtualization, you probably don't need that stuff. This PAE thing is um, paged address extensions. It's for 32-bit, primarily for 32-bit systems that need more than uh, four gigs of RAM. I know that 64-bit systems, I'm pretty sure, use that mode, but I don't think it has, if you happen to do more than 4 gigs, which in a virtual machine to me is a little bit crazy, but, um, you know, for just thinking around and stuff. But anyway, you could check those. I don't think they'll hurt anything. The main one to make sure that's checked over here is on this last acceleration tab is hardware virtualization. Enable nested paging. All right, so yeah, dual core, 2 gigs of memory, whatever. Okay, for display... Um, you could just leave this as it is for now. We'll go ahead and do that because I want to show you this way. We don't run into any weird glitches or anything. It's just kind of at the stock stuff, but we'll go back up and peg the megabytes to 128 and switch this 3d acceleration on and deal with that in a minute and storage. So I'm going to click on this CD ROM thing and then click on this CD ROM over here. And I'm going to choose a disc file and navigate to that Arch Linux ISO file that was downloaded. But as you can see, I've recently um, downloaded and utilized mine so it knows it has it in its recently used list. So I'm going to go ahead and just click that one. Yeah, 786 megabytes. So it should... Ooh, that might be just bigger than a standard CD-ROM. I don't know. Depends on the details of the ISO. Okay, and then of course, this is that uh, VirtualBox hard drive. That, uh, that we created that 16 gigabytes. As you can see here, actual size is only two megabytes right now. So it's just basically the metadata about the drive. If you know you're running a solid state drive inside of your current computer, you might click solid state drive. Um, and then for audio, I'm gonna go ahead and disable it. You can leave it enabled. I just seem, last time I was messing around, I think it was with Debian Linux and I was trying to do like a screencast or something with audio enabled. It seemed like it was having some trouble competing with the host and guest system for audio. Maybe it was just me, but I'm just unchecking it to be safe. And then network, instead of attached to NAT, which makes it basically go through your host operating system, uh, we can do bridged adapter, I recommend. And bridged will make it so that it's as if you were just, as if your virtual machine was directly connected to your uh, router, modem, whatever. So you don't have that NAT thing going on. Um, there's pros and cons to each, but if you're on the fence, I just pick, pick bridged. It's a lot easier. Um, the rest of this stuff I just leave as the defaults. If you, I can't remember, I probably installed the VirtualBox uh, extensions, I think they're called, that gives you USB 2.0 and 3.0. Even without them installed, it might give you 2.0. Otherwise, just make sure it's checked and that you at least have USB 1.1, which for like keyboards and mice and the basic stuff like that, that should all be fine. And I'm not going to cover share folders in this one. Okay. And then I'm going to click OK down here to save those settings. And then I'll just double click on this Arch machine, virtual machine. That should boot up. Might take a minute. It usually takes a minute even if I'm not doing a screencast. Okay, so this is one of the things that kind of annoys me is even though I just selected that ISO file, it's still asking me. So I'm going to click this, and there it is right there. You can double-click that to make it, or I think you can expand it. But yeah, you basically just have to, like, it's ridiculous in my opinion. Um and it's really a complicated interface too. But yeah, 
They're going to probably bug you on the first startup. Otherwise, I think you can hit cancel and just go back into the settings on the virtual machine. I'm just going to hit enter on this top one. Otherwise, like I said, you can hit cancel, go back to the virtual machine, right click and go to settings again and go back down to that storage and double check that that ISO file still in there. If it's not, if it removed it, go ahead and click the other little CD icon and add it back in again. And that time when you boot, I think it won't ask you that stupid pop up. All right, so this is just the live system. It's console only. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely, we've got to make our system, our system's going to be completely bare bones once this is booted up. So I'll go ahead and put this one over there like this and put this one like this. We'll see if we can kind of get the best of both worlds maybe. All right, so it has us logged in as root. If you can see that. What I can do too is I can try scaled yeah, that's even smaller. So the right control key on your keyboard by default is called the host key. So there's a lot of things. If you're inside of your system and you're wanting to do a regular control command later on, you got to remember to use the left control. And then the right controls for your virtual machine, like virtual box itself. So to get to that scale mode, I hit effectively, I could hit control C. And then right now I just hit control C to get out of it to get back to this one where you can see the menu bar across the top and then down here at the bottom you can see the indicators you have the drive indicator which will flash when it's accessing the hard drive the CD indicator the network indicator USB and so on that's pretty handy one of the things that's kind of annoying is by default it will uh, make your mouse cursor disappear when you go over it I can't remember exactly what setting to like disable that but once you get into the X Windows system and all that, it's not as big of a deal. I guess what that is is so that when you do have the cursor on the Linux system, that it doesn't, uh, your host cursor doesn't interfere with it. But if I try different, like if you click into it, it's going to capture the mouse cursor. Is that what it does? No, it's not good. But if you do get stuck in there, there's a way like, I think you can just hit like, um, do like control F to go full screen and then hit control the right control F again to get out and I think that will give you back your mouse cursor all right anyway so what we can do now is just start what I've done here with this is I've basically have an abridged version of the official Arch Linux install guide because theirs is really detailed so this is just gonna give you a quick list you can just almost copy and paste everything to uh, get it to go but the thing is is that copy and paste isn't enabled just yet so what we're gonna do is run this ping command just to double check that the internet's up and there we can see there's the uh, the milliseconds time milliseconds on the far right if it basically looks similar to that then uh, that means it's working all right otherwise it's probably sitting there right now still trying to ping the internet um, in which case shouldn't do that if your Windows or whatever your host system is is connected to the internet just fine then that should be working okay and then we're gonna run F disk and we give it the device in Linux and Unix like stuff this is how the devices look everything's you might have heard everything's a file in Unix so you access it like a file and SDA 1 basically means I think like the first SCSI disk or serial ATA disk and that's what we want cannot open no such file or directory oh you know what I think that's just SDA F disk slash dev slash SDA I'll have to fix that yeah it is okay so real quick before I forget I'll go in here and uh, edit this thing and get rid of that and update it all right and then what we can do from here is just follow these menus. This is M for menu, the menu commands. So M will give us that menu of all the stuff, all the neat stuff we could do. 
with this kind of ugly little basic program. And then just going down the list, number two says lowercase o, so I'm just going to hit that o, enter. Create a new DOS dislabel with this identifier. So what I'm doing is I'm skipping a lot of these install guides will tell you like set up a swap file and, you know, make sure not do a DOS partition table and all this kind of stuff or an MBR partition table. I say forget it. You know, you don't want to swap file in a virtual machine. I mean, if push comes to shove, yeah, there are some instances where that might work out okay for you. But for the most part, that's one of those checkboxes we used was to tell it to go to our system swap file if necessary and uh, our host system and otherwise swapping in a virtual machine just 99 percent of the time is not ideal so and plus i don't even honestly if you have plenty of room i usually don't even create a swap file outside of a virtual machine but anyway that's just to let you know with this setup i'm skipping the whole swap file i'm skipping the whole boot partition all that unnecessary cruft is staying out of here so Doing the DOS MBR, then we're going to hit end to add a new partition. And it's going to be a P for primary partition. And then partition table default or partition number default one. So just hit enter. First sector default 2048. Just hit enter. And last sector default blah, 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 blah. Just hit enter. And uh, yes to remove signature if asked. So if you had. If you're editing an old partition table like I was in one instance, you'd need to hit Y there, but it didn't ask us, so we don't do it. What would that Y do otherwise if somebody accidentally hit it? Maybe I should just remove it from the menu. I'm just going to hit it Y, command unknown. Okay, won't hurt anything. Okay, so T for type, and then uh, it says hex code or alias. So the alias, we can just enter Linux, which I believe is type 83. And then we hit A to toggle the boot flag. The bootable flag on partition one is enabled now. And then we're going to hit W because all this is just sort of like in memory. And we have to hit W to actually uh, commit these changes to the disk. All right. The partition table has been altered. Reread the partition table syncing disk. And I went ahead and said to uh, go ahead and reboot. So... I think one time it did tell me to reboot, but maybe that's optional. I don't know. So I'll just type it out, reboot. And we'll just go through that. So this time we'll come back into the system and we'll just start right where we left off. Go ahead and hit enter right there. And we're going to create a file system. And here's another way that I deviate from the uh, official install guide of most modern Linuxes is they'll tell you to create like an extended three or four journaling partition and I mean to me usually I don't keep like super sensitive stuff on a virtual machine so I don't care about the journaling that's where it goes in and does all this like careful uh, accounting on you know where all your files are written and whoop de whoop so that it can recover files a little bit better if like you know you lose power or something during a copy or whatever so with the extended to partition type, that's the old school Linux partition type from like 10, 20 years ago. And it's just faster, lighter weight. So still has all the features we care about. So I just go ahead and do that. And there's our root prompt. So I'll type mkfs dot ext2. And then I think this quiet flag, I'm trying to get it, figure out how to not... And then now we're going to put SDA1 because SDA refers to the entire disk and then SDA1 refers to the first partition on that disk. I was thinking about maybe trying QV. So Q looks like it, it doesn't ask you, like normally I think it does a yes, no there. And Q just does quiet mode, so I guess it assumes yes. Kind of want to check if QV will show us all the details. Ah, uh, no. Okay. Yeah, anyway, you don't have to put the Q there if you don't want, and it will actually show you the, uh, like, a little percentage meter or something like that. Anyway, so now we need to mount this, and I put every time. So if something happens, you need to take a break, shut down your virtual machine, or some other problem occurs, and you have to jump back in. 
and pick up where you left off. There's a few commands that I pit. Uh, this this is a comment after the hash mark. So it says every time, and that means if you come back in and you need to catch back up with where you were, you want to run all these commands with every time on them. But the other ones, if you've run them successfully already, then they're done. Okay, so we just need to run that portion of the command there. So this is actually going to mount that first partition, dev sda1, on in the mount folder on this uh, temporary live system that we're booting off that ISO image. Okay, and now what we can do, I have a little link to the live system package list, just maybe of some interest for people. So now we're here at the pack strap da 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 thing. So this is a little script they have, a little official script, and it's going to take everything that we list from base Linux, da da da, onward, it's going to copy, unpack those packages onto that uh, first partition that we've now mounted on this MNT location. Okay, so there's Linux, you could do plain Linux, you could do Linux LTS, which is long term support Linux. So that one will kind of be sort of locked in place, but receive bug fixes for a longer period of time. Linux by itself, of course, is just the standard, most current Linux that Arch provides. And then Linux Zen is supposedly like tuned for desktop or whatever. So if you think you might be running anything like graphically intensive or whatever, you might try out that one. Um, I'm going to, for this install, I'm just going to try LTS. And then Nano's a text editor. What else do I have in here? Uh ManDB is the man manual page database, very handy. And then man-pages is the actual man pages. And then text info is the uh the info viewer, which is kind of like the old school man pages, a little bit different angle of attack for the online help. Alright, so we got the Linux kernel. Oh, I forgot base. Don't forget base. I've got base, the Linux kernel, a text editor, and the man page online help stuff. And I'm going to hit enter. All right, so it's going to download 285 megabytes, and afterwards it's going to take up the installed size is going to be about 737 megabytes. And I might go ahead and just pause the video for this part because I think it will take at least a few minutes. But if you want, go ahead and pause the video now too and then we'll both unpause and come back and be at the same exact point when we're, as soon as this is all run. All right. So that didn't take too long, only about five minutes actually. Uh, you might have received some of these warnings that say warning possibly missing firmware for module whatever uh that is not necessary on the virtual machine because it's detecting your fake virtual machine hardware and uh it's saying hey we should probably install firmware but you don't have chips to install that firmware too the virtual box is basically just emulating and forwarding that to uh I shouldn't even say emulating, probably. It's just providing, like, the, I would imagine, the bare-bones interface. And anyway, in their official install guide, they recommend not even installing the firmware in a virtual machine either. That's where I got the idea to not do it. So that explains that. And we're now at Gen FS tab. So this is going to generate a file system tab that the system just uses to remember your whole partition scheme and whatever kind of stuff like that. GenFS tab. And with these commands, we're running them as root. Anytime on a Linux system, when you run any commands as root, just always after you're done typing, you know, type them carefully and uh, review them before you send them through. So I've got GenFS tab minus U slash mount. And then that double, that Chevron looking thing is appending. 
to that file. If there was just the single greater than sign, that would overwrite the entire file. So we just want to append to what might already be there. And if there's no file there, it will create it. OK, and I'm going to hit Enter. And then the next command is arch ch root. So this is another one of those little fancy scripts. And then I have every time there because you need to do that every time. And this is going to go into that mount directory. What does it say? Correct. Whoa, it's auto-correcting it. I'm just going to hit enter. Um, it's going to go into that mount folder where we mounted that new partition that we made. And it's going to pretend like it actually booted into that system. So... That's what's going on. CH root, I believe, stands for change root. So it's changing our root folder to that point. So now, even though we're in the mount folder, it thinks we're at slash only, which is the very highest top of the tree of the file system. But we still should have most, I don't know about most of our utilities. We only have the utilities probably that it just installed. It's been a long time since I really got dirty with Linux. Okay, so now I'm going to link sf slash user this is a real long one so be extra careful share zone info if you don't care about having the right time then you don't have to do this so what i'm going to do here is i've followed it up until i got to that capital r and then i'm going to hit tab a couple times and what that does is it shows me a list of possible auto completions i'm in the us so i'm going to type us and i'm going to hit tab a couple times three times because it added the slash for me. Okay, and then there's the zones in the US, so I'm gonna type pack and let it auto-complete with tab, Pacific. And that way I know for sure I'm not, you know, I'm picking the right, something that's actually there. And then I put a space and a slash, etc. slash local time. Oh, I'm not in the virtual machine, gotta highlight the virtual machine. Space, etc. space, slash, etc. local time. And I'm going to come back over here and double check local time, user share. Let me see if I can put this back just a little ways this way. Look right there. Bring these down. Okay. User share zone info looks good enough to me. All right sending it through and that just basically lets the system know like most Linux systems it will keep the so-called system clock in UTC for the virtual machine but it's not I don't remember so the virtual machine must because I have a Windows system so that means my system clock is set to my real local time and then I believe the virtual machine translates that into UTC because most physical Linux systems are in UTC and then the software into Linux converts it to your local time zone all right so then we're going to do nano and I still left the minus W on here the recent versions of nano don't require that anymore but it used to be something that I was just in the habit for years and years of typing because that would uh prevent it from doing hard line wraps and stuff which was just seem kind of ridiculous that it would do that by default so they finally fixed it so that's optional now but i just do it just in case anybody's following along with an older a little bit older system or something okay so we're going to edit the etc locale gen file and then i'm going to go way down and find en oh went too far way down where is it maybe i didn't hitting page down now okay yeah I gotta look at the little letters not the big ones so there's ENCA so you're probably familiar with yours oh man really what are these out of alphabetical order EN there it is okay I'm just going to uncomment that one that it's right here I can't hover over it or it will uh, disappear, but it's EN, US, UTF-8, UTF-8. If you're unsure, I guess just do that one. Um, otherwise, if you know your language, you know ES for Spanish, 
Um, I'm not sure what the country letters are after that. Maybe BOs like Bolivia or something. And then you'll want to do the UTF-8 at least. And so after that, I can hit Control X and then Y, yes, to save the modified buffer. And then just hit Enter to save over that same file. Okay, and now we can run, where are we at? We just ran this one. We just did all that. So now we need to run Locale Gen. So it's processing based on that new information we provided by uncommenting it in the config file. And it's done. So we'll do a nano minus W, etc. locale dot conf. And then you can see I have the numbers one and two there. So those are the two steps. So for step one, we need to add lang equals en underscore us dot utf dash eight. Whoa. Okay. It's off the screen a little bit because of my screen size. I have it blown up to 10, uh, 1280 by 720 so that I can film this in standard high def. Uh, of course, your screen's probably a little bit bigger. So yeah, laying in, you double check all that. I'm going to hit control X, then Y, and then enter again. And then I have to scroll back down so we can see the prompt. Okay. And then we can type P-A-S-S-W-D for the password. And that's going to ask us a new password for root. So I usually just type in a PIN number or something on these virtual machines because they're easy to enter and they're less likely to be compromised, I feel like, than a regular full-on system. Okay. So now we need to install the bootloader so this is the thing that goes at the very beginning of this hard disk the first few bytes you know it's going to go in and it's going to say hey we've got a linux system here and if this was like a bigger machine or something that had more operating systems even windows installed it could find those and it could allow the user to dual boot and select different operating systems but even though we're not dual booting we still need something to kind of point it and say hey just go over here to this linux partition so that's what this grub thing is going to do. So we're going to do Pac-Man. And Pac-Man is the package manager. This is like basically the old school version of an app store. Even better than an app store. Not all the ridiculous cruff that comes along with those app stores. No account necessary. None of that junk. Um, and obviously runs at the command line. So it's called Pac-Man. You do a minus capital S to install stuff. And we're going to do grub. Oh, one thing you can do too with these commands, if you don't know, is do a dash dash help. And then there you can see. So Pac-Man minus S, that S stands for sync. Capital S. Or we could do dash dash lowercase sync. It's the same thing. And then we're going to install grub. And then just hit enter to say yes, effectively right here. If you're cool with that, it's going to download almost 7 megabytes. And it's going to take almost 33 megabytes after it's installed. Okay, and then we type grub install dash dash target equals i386 dash pc slash dev slash sda. So we're just referring to the whole disk, not the um, the partition. All right, looks good. If it complains for any reason, just double check everything you typed there. And then we can do nano minus W, etc. default grub. And then what we're looking for here is where I have number one right there. It says grub command line Linux default log level three. I add this mitigations off to the end of that. So where's that? Grub Linux command line default right here. I'm going to go to the end, add a space, mitigations, hard to spell. Mitigations equals OFF. So that's like those, uh, I can't even remember what they're called, but a few years back 
those uh, potential holes in some of the CPUs where people could go in and cause them in these really weird circumstances to execute some bad code. If you're worried about all that, go ahead and leave them on. But otherwise, on certain CPUs, that can make them like 25% faster or something like that to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Then I'm going to hit Control X, Y, and Enter. And then we'll do a grub mk config minus lowercase o and boot grub grub cfg. Generating grub configuration file, found the Linux kernel and all that stuff. It looks like it's good. It doesn't have any errors or complaints. It has one warning that uh, the OS proper will not be executed to detect other bootable partitions. Usually warnings are fine to just ignore. Okay, so now we need to keep following the directions. It says exit and reboot. Okay, so now if we scroll down a little bit more, virtual box device optical drives remove disk. So go up here to the virtual box menu, device optical drives and then remove disk and it's mad because it's trying to use it so we're gonna hit force unmount and then we need to go ahead and just go to machine or is that what it is we need to reboot one more yeah machine reset or the right control key in R and then we can hit enter on Arch Linux so now this is our we've removed that ISO image from the virtual drive and this is our Arch Linux system completely bare bones installed. Excuse me, sorry. And that's what we're booting into. So our login is going to be root and then that password that we entered. And if you don't remember your root password, you probably have to start all over with those steps. Okay, so general recommendations. If you click on this, it will take you to that wiki page, which at the bottom of the install guide, towards the bottom, they say, hey, you can go here and look at some other stuff you might want to do. So I cherry pick some stuff that seemed like either essential or just nice to have for the virtual machine. So we can start running these commands, network, control, list. That nano W should be on a different line. Okay, so we can see right here that, that EMP0S3 Ether, that's that bridge network device that we have in there. And don't forget with this, as far as this Arch Linux installs inside of this virtual machine, even if you're using Wi-Fi outside on your host system, in the virtual machine, it thinks you're using a wired connection. So it doesn't matter if you're Wi-Fi outside of it. As far as this Linux per se install goes, uh, you're, you're wired. All right, so now let's nano minus W, etc. And you can just type a few letters like SYS and hit tab a couple times. And then we, we're trying to get to system MD, so I'm going to hit TEM and then I'm going to hit tab, see how it completed it. And then we can do net tab 20 and it doesn't look like I'm gonna to have to hand type this because we're actually gonna end up creating this file this is a startup file to configure the basic networking and then we're just gonna duplicate what we see there So this is what a lot of those other Linux distributions do like this kind of stuff for you. But by going in here and doing it, you can see, oh, this is where this is set up, right? I'm going to add a final blank line. That's typically a good idea. And then hit Control X, Y, Enter to save it. But yeah, you get to see kind of uh, really get your hands on the nuts and bolts of this stuff. And then we need to enable the services because if I were to do that ping minus c3 example.com so there's what happens when it, it doesn't work ping example.com temporary failure in name resolution 
It's like, what? We just set it up. Well, we still have to do a few more things. So we got to do system CTL enable system D dash network D. And I don't think we actually even have to use the word service at the end. Okay. And then I'm going to hit up and I'm going to go back and change the word enable to start to actually fire up that service. And then I'm going to hit up twice and get back to the enabled one. But at the end, I'm going to change this network D to resolve D. Resolved. And then I'm going to hit up again and change enabled for that one to start. So we're just enabling and starting those two services. The old fashioned way. Okay, so now if I ping minus c3 example.com spell it right now we can see we're pinging so we're back on the internet all right so now we're to the getting more and more fun parts so pac-man these are just you don't have to run all these commands right now but i just figured oh, i'll just throw them all in there so that we can see kind of like the main ones we want to run right now is we want to update the system if there's a particular package you're thinking that you definitely want to install, you do a search and you can search out multiple strings, but basically that's the command part. And then these strings are whatever keywords you want to look for. This is info on a particular package. So if you're like, Oh, you know, how much does that package take up or what's included? What dependencies, any of that kind of stuff, you can do that. Of course, replace the word package with the actual package name. Um, this is that one we've already run to install a package or more. And after we're all done, like with this little session of running Pac-Man, we should run minus capital S, lowercase c, lowercase c, which will clean the caches. And then if we decide, oh, we don't want a particular package, we can run that. The capital R will remove, and I believe the S will remove any unneeded um, dependencies. Okay. And I have reflector in here, but I'm having second thoughts on that one. It finds like the fastest mirror based. I mean, it's cool. It can do some cool stuff, but I don't think I'm going to run it this time because the mirrors that it was finding based on the parameters I was giving it, they were fast, but they didn't include some of the packages that I wanted. So um, that's something you'd want to read into a little more if you want to use that. So let's go ahead and update our system. Pac-Man minus capital S YYU. So that's going to sync everything again, download the latest, greatest, supposedly nothing to do, not a surprise because it's probably already tried that earlier. And here's some stuff we can install this Pac-Man minus S stuff. So Pac-Man minus capital S. I'll go ahead and install Reflector. I'm not scared of it. And if you want to do it all on one line without the backslashes, you can too. So we'll do base devel color. These are things that are all optional. Python, just some stuff I like to have on there. And GPM. GPMs to be able to use the mouse in the console, which I don't think I have any instructions to set up. And base develop, there's the stuff that it's going to install. Uh, Autoconf, auto make, bin utils, bison, fake root, file. Uh, find Utils, Flex, Gawk, GCC, the C compiler, Git Text, Grep, Groff, Gzip, LibTool, M4, Make, Pac-Man, Patch, PKG, Conf, Sed, Sudo, Text Info, and Witch. So I'm just going to hit Enter to get all of them, which some of them we already have, obviously. All those ones that it says Warning, we already have. And here's the ones we don't have. All that cool stuff. So it's going to be an 81 megabyte download. 434 megabyte install which is going to end up taking 354 megs more than we have right now than we've already used so i'm going to hit enter for yes and of course imagine this will probably take at least another five minutes or so and i'm going to pause the video and encourage you to do the same and then after we're both done on our ends we'll unpause and be synced back up all right that was like one minute Okay.
So now we need to add a normal user because it's really bad practice like on a lot of other systems to be logged in as the root super user all the time because of all the stuff you can do with it. So we're going to just create a normal average user that just has the typical user permissions can't really damage the system too much on their own. On Linux it can't hardly damage the system at all as a regular user unless you run specific commands as a super user. Okay, so to do that we'll do user add minus lowercase m minus uppercase g and then we'll go ahead and add to the FTP comma games these are all the groups HTTP sys UUCP I just went through the list of default groups and I was like okay these look like the ones you know some of them you'll probably never use or whatever but uh, games is obviously nice right who doesn't like games HTTP for doing some networking stuff maybe using web stuff I don't know it's a little different on every system um, between like the different distributions and wheel is the one that's like an alternative to sudo for a group name and that allows us to run commands specific one-off commands as a uh, with root privileges like when we want to update the system stuff like that okay so we'll do all that and then what we need to do on the end there is add the username so my username's all lowercase, mine's going to be veganase. And then that password's supposed to be on the next line down. You can tell right there the way there's a little gap there. So if you see that, I, hopefully, uh, I plan to have, by the time that you probably get around to viewing this, I should have fixed those little minor glitches or whatever. But if not, just pay attention on that. Otherwise, I'll probably give you an error anyway. Okay, that's going to create the user veganase with all that stuff. I'm um, type pass WD and then veganes so that it knows not to do the root password, right? It's going to do this other user and type in a new pin number password for that one. Password updated successfully. So now this is one kind of tricky thing is we type editor since we didn't install uh vi or vim or anything like that i'm not a particular fan of those if you are you might have already installed them but what we have to do is we have to do this little temporary environment variable oops lowercase linux systems are case sensitive for the most part unlike windows so uh nano so what that does is that's going to set the editor environment variable in our shell to nano the editor that we did install that we have been using and then it's going to run the command by sudo and <laughs> so obviously the name of this command is like vi for the vi editor right and uh sudo is whatever so what it, it does normally is it normally would run vim and allow you to edit this little file and the reason it's so complicated you can use a normal editor to do it but you're supposed to do it this way so that it preserves all the permissions and everything just right so that's the whole reason all, all that craftiness and then we just hit enter and then what we'll do is we'll scroll down till we find wheel the wheel line down here somewhere okay there it is put my cursor just outside of it over here so it's it's right there. It says that percent wheel. I'm going to uncomment it and I basically hit delete twice right there. Slam it up against the rail. So it's wheel all all no password all no pass WD. So that the one catch there is that sudo's not protected by a password, but you will have to type sudo in front of a command. So you'll have to make that conscious effort at least to be like, hey, I'm running a super user command, right? The other way that a lot of systems like Debian do it, or uh, right here, this one where it's sudo all, all. The other alternative you could do is you can either just on wheel, you can just get rid of that no password colon thing and make it look just like that sudo line. And then that will ask you for your password every so often. So you get the double protection initially. And then, you know, I don't know if it's every 15 minutes or per terminal session. I can't remember. But, uh, there's that, or if you don't want to, you know, if you want to leave it all the same, you could just come down and also uncomment sudo and add your user to that group and maybe remove them from wheel, whatever. I'm just doing it this way. This is the easiest way. 
So I've uncommented the line with wheel on it. I'm going to hit Control X, Y, and Enter. And now we're at the color console stuff. This isn't mandatory. As a matter of fact, I'm root user right now, so I'm going to exit. Is that what I'm going to do? What am I going to do? Let's see. What do we have here? We have X11 right after that. We'll come back to this stuff. Let's go ahead and install the X11 stuff. Okay, so Pac-Man. Well, we're still root, of course. You need to have super user privileges to install. LXDE Xorg. And with those backslashes in there, that enables you, if you did have copy and paste ability, you could just do all that, right-click, copy, and then come over here, bi-directional, right-click, copy and paste. Um, Xorg knit. These are the unaccelerated video drivers. Pretty sure the brain buffer one is two XF. Yeah, it is. But I was testing it with Mesa, which is the software 3D OpenGL stuff, and it was still doing really good for the little tests I ran on it, so I was surprised. Leaf pad's kind of like a notepad alternative. And Chromium is the uh open source version of the Chrome browser or Microsoft Edge and everything but Firefox pretty much now, and maybe not Safari, it automatically installs Firefox, if I remember correctly. So that's why I have Chromium added here. TK, which is required for TK Enter, um, the idle editor for Python 3, that's why I have that. And then this TTF, Deja Vu, and uh, TTF-Droid, will give us some extra fonts. And when I was digging through the wikis, there's maybe a couple old programs that might complain or crash or something if those aren't in there. So I figured oh, I'll just throw them in. Or I'm gonna hit enter. And it's saying there are 17 members in the group LXDE. All right, so I guess it's gonna pull in all that stuff that's all under that LXDE umbrella. So we've got the picture viewer, we've got an icon theme, we've got the display manager, which I'm not gonna set up in this session, and music, the panel, the uh, thing to change the screen, the renders, the screen resolution thing, the terminal, PC man file manager, and open box is sort of transparently the behind the scenes window manager. Okay, I'm gonna hit enter for all. And then this is for that xorg package, I believe. And it's pulling in all that stuff. So I guess I didn't even need to add video visa. It probably would have pulled that in itself. Hmm, okay. Good to know, enter for all. Target xorg init not found. Oh, it's xorg, xorg x init. Enter, enter. Uh, available for Jack. I'm just gonna hit enter for the default one. All right, so it's gonna bring in all that stuff. Uh, download size 261 and a half megabytes. Installed size just over 974 megabytes. Enter for yes or why for yes, whatever. 253 packages to download and install. My guess is five minutes again. I don't know. I'm going to pause it, pause it with me, and unpause it as soon as your stuff's all done. Download and unpack and install it. Wow, that was fast. Okay. So I'm going to skip past. This was something I had put in before. I guess I didn't come back and revise this file quite as much as I thought I had. This is optional, just like some of this other stuff. You know, the Chromium's optional. Highly recommend LeafPad. These are optional. Um, even these, I guess, are optional. And all that. I mean, most of these packages we've done with Pac-Man so far, most of them are optional. Just so you know.
so you can mix and match and change it to whatever you want but of course if you're unsure about anything just stick with me but anyway I had done this before because I wasn't able to get the X windows to start back in the day like back in the 90s or whatever you used to have to like with most of the distributions you used to have to go in and hand edit a uh, X config file but nowadays that's not so much the case I thought like oh this is arch I'm gonna have to do it so what I did was I I ran this command right here and what this will do you can see in the virtual machine here we're in that little tilde at the end of root arch Linux and then the tilde that tilde means we're in our home folder so if I type pwd for the root that's slash root but for every other user it's slash home slash username so slash home slash vegan A's right uh, as a matter of fact let's go ahead and log out since we've created and I'm gonna log back in as my username vegan A's with that password and now if I do a PWD I'm in that tilde folder if I do a PWD you can see it's slash home slash vegan A's so now we're in safe land as our regular user and we can just prefix anything with sudo and then it's telling us what our options are so one trick you probably shouldn't do too often is you can type sudo space bash and that will just give you a, a, a root command prompt so if you don't like typing sudo in between every little thing that's one option but then you might forget your root and cause some problems and you just type exit to get back to uh to the regular user and as you can see i didn't even have to type in my password for sudo so that's that anyway if we type xorg configure i guess i should have done that one as root so i could do sudo root or whatever or sudo bash i'm sorry and run this one uh because what it's going to do is no matter where you run it it's going to create it in the home folder for that user then as root you'll need to uh you might replace that with slash home slash username if you ran it as somebody besides root but then you need to do like a sudo move and you'd run that command i need to fix these up so they're not wrapping and all on the same line and all this junk but once again, just look out for those little spaces. So uh, this will move it from the home folder, this xorg conf new file from the home folder. It will move it to etc. x11, xorg conf regular. And then you do a nano minus w, uh, etc. Da, 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 to that file. Or you can cd to that directory and run that. Um, and then what you do is you go find the section monitor and append this to the bottom of that little paragraph and then go find the section screen and then add this under the first little paragraph in that section and then down and then go find the subsection display and uh, add these modes add some modes to it so but you don't have to do that that was just something I thought I had to do initially and then right here here's the thing we do want to do we want to do that so we'll do nano minus w the tilde for our home directory which we're already in dot x init rc one word and then we're going to add exec space start lxde and that will tell it to actually start the uh i'm going to hit control x y enter that will tell it to go ahead and run that way by running the LXDE desktop environment that we just installed. So now we can just type start X and give it a minute or so, if even that. First time running, I don't know, it might have to probe some extra stuff. And here we are with X Windows. Very nice. So coming back over here. So one of the first things we'll want to do is this VirtualBox Guest Editions. And you can see if I click this little menu, it's kind of like the start menu in Windows. I like, I personally like this old like Windows 9X look for this menu, but there are other themes and such that you can install and make it look a little more modern. I'm, like I said, I'm using this LXDE desktop environment, which is designed to be lightweight and slightly old-fashioned look I don't think it's too ugly but uh that's just that's kind of like the price we pay to use that environment I think it's well worth it because if I go to this menu and go to preferences here or uh, system tools and then task manager then you can see if I can get this thing to maximize the memory it's only using 170 megabytes of memory 
like with a full-on desktop environment, you know, a basic simple one, but still, it's nothing. So that's the reason, one of the main reasons. Plus, I just, I like it. It it does what I need it to do. There's LeafPad, the Notepad kind of alternative and stuff. So anyway, you can see it's going pretty good speed. So what we'll do is up on this virtual box menu up here, the host system one, we'll go to devices, insert guest edition CD image down here. I'm going to click that. So now it's effectively open that virtual drive and slid in the ISO for the guest editions, which comes included with virtual box. I recommend doing it this way, not using the ones that come with your distribution because you'd only want to do that if you're actually using them as the host. But since they're the guests, they need to line up with the version of the editions of your host, if that makes sense. Okay, so... What I like to do is I'll right click on this taskbar and I'll say, uh, go up here to the settings and, hmm, oh, panel settings right here. And then I put that on top, position top. That's where I like it because it makes sense to me. All my menus are already up there and that's where I go for everything. What was that other one? Taskbar window list settings, icons, flat button. Anyway, you could dig in here and use mouse wheel whatever so if I use the mouse wheel down here you can see desktop one and two that's also right here you can pick desktop one and two so you can have I mean you can have a dozen of them or whatever if you want but say we open up something like accessories leaf pad then we want a blank desktop we can just click over here and do other stuff over here and then we want to get back to leaf pad it's right there so anyway that's how that works um, right here you there's a little one it's hard to see it's the PC file manager, basically like Windows Explorer or whatever, what's Mac called the Finder or something. I really like this program. We can go to edit preferences. I uncheck move deleted to trash can for virtual machines. I just think it's a waste. Um, I don't know if there's always show full file names, maybe. Okay, I guess that's it. Show icons of hidden files shadowed. Hmm, try that one. Okay, so we're in our home folder slash home slash vegan A's. What, okay, right here, view and then show hidden. That's the one I always like. Then it shows you these dot files. So I don't know, maybe you don't want that on all the time. You can toggle it on and off. But the cool thing about showing those is like, that's like your bash RC. You can open that file up and come in here. This is where those things up here are handy. Like all this stuff. We can just. Oh, well, let me add the guest editions first so that we can actually access that bi-directional cut and paste. Okay. So close all that out. Guest editions. We inserted the CD. So now we need to go to, uh, to the command prompt so we can run these. So that's LX terminal. And we can just go to System Tools, LX Terminal. And I'll go ahead and maximize that. I'm going to go in and adjust a few preferences on this. Edit Preferences. I'm going to switch the pellet to... Uh, was Tango the good one? Oh, I forgot. This is... It's hard to get to in this mode. Okay, okay. The way to check it is LS minus ALH. These blues right here over the dark background, they're hard to see on the default color scheme, so... That's why I do that. And either Tango or Solarize Dark, I think, are the best ones for that. Um, I add a zero to this. And that... Oops. I don't have a NumLock on. Okay, I add a zero to that. And that makes it 10,000 lines of scroll back. Instead of just 1,000, I'd recommend at least 10,000. That way you can scroll your mouse wheel or this little scroll bar over here after you run a long thing, which you couldn't do in that last terminal we were at. All right. And I guess the rest of that's good for now. Slide that up and hit this little OK button. All right. Oh, I was... One more thing. I wanted to change this to a monospace bold and an 18.
on your system that probably shouldn't be quite as huge as it is on mine and I'm going to remedy that right after I install guest editions it should uh I'll type clear to get back up to the top it should be able to scale the screen better okay so we'll do a cd or no it says sudo pacman sync linux and I didn't do Zen, so I'm not going to copy this exactly. I did LTS here. And if you just did the regular Linux kernel, it would just be Linux dash headers, right? All right. I'm tempted just to leave it running based on how fast it's gone. So this is going to download the header files are like the C programming header dot H files that allow other stuff that custom compiles like the VirtualBox guest editions are going to custom compile themselves for our, our kernel, which is pretty cool. It's kind of like instead of on Windows or those other systems, typically they'll j they won't custom compile. They won't integrate quite as tightly as this stuff does typically. So as soon as it's done doing that, we'll mount that virtual CD that we have. If we come up here to devices, optical drives, then we can see it says remove disk from drive. It doesn't show a check mark next to any disk, but the fact that remove disk from drive without the check mark is lit up and we could click it, which I'm not going to. That lets us know that this guest editions was inserted. Actually, I will just, oh just to show. So remove disk from drive. Ah, I'll hit cancel, but you can see right there it says VirtualBox Guest Editions. I'm going to leave it in there. If you told it to force unmount, then just go back here and click that again. Okay, and now we can type sudo and mount that disk, just like we did during the install, but different disk, obviously. And we're going to mount the device CD-ROM to slash mount CD-ROM. Uh, mount point does not exist. May have... Oh, I need to fix that. So it's just going to be slash mount. Okay, source only. Uh, source write protected. Okay. So now if we go to... Well, we'll just run it like I have it in there. sudo bash slash mount slash capital VB. You can hit tab a few times to get the tab completion. And you can see it's a virtual box, this one. You could even just highlight it if you want and copy it. And then I'll hit the backspace a few times and then right click, paste. So there it is. sudo bash slash mount slash vbox linux editions dot run. And it's off to the races. So it's going to quickly compile some modules that will give us some more functionality, most especially better uh, graphics capabilities. That's why we don't have to go edit that configure, that XORG configure file that I was worried about. I had done that initially before I installed the guest system or additions when I was kind of knocking all this out. Right, as long as there's no errors here. It says look at this to find out what went wrong, but I don't think that necessarily means anything went wrong. And right here it's saying it will not be replaced until the system is restarted. So that's worthy of noting. Once we get our command prompt back. Come on, virtual box. Okay, command prompts back, it's all done. We're gonna click the menu, the desktop taskbar menu. We're gonna click log out and then click reboot. I'm gonna hit enter right here. Okay, so from here we have basically a couple choices left. We can do the color console stuff and we can enable 3D acceleration.
I'm going to pause this because I need to use the restroom. Uh, whatever. I'll just do it. Okay. So, logging in with that regular username. Sometimes your numbers lock key, if you do that, it might get out of sync. So, you might have to hit it two or three times to get it to kick back into sync. All right. And then right here, you just hit Start X. That's sort of the, the flow for this is that instead of using a display manager for X or whatever, we're just using the good old fast. This is like the classic login, you know, so you just have to type start X. I don't think it's a big idea, a uh, big deal. Plus you automatically start at the console, like the good old DOS days, you know, and then when you want windows, you just start X into it. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the horse before the carriage on this one. And now we should have, so I have input, what is it? Devices, shared clipboard, bidirectionals on. So if I go over here and copy this, I triple click that to get that whole line, copy it. And then I come over here and it's a sudo, whatever. So I'll do it in the terminal, system tools, LX terminal. even go a little bigger with this oh you see that how it auto expanded when I went big I could even hit right control and F to go full screen and really get bigger of course I'm only at 7 or 1280 by 720 right now so that's it's not gonna get much bigger than that maximize this I'm gonna right click paste hey there's that command from uh, the Windows host okay now I'm gonna hit enter so this is Pac-Man's installing Mesa Utils and the XF86 Video VMware driver. So that VMware is, I guess, what the VMS VGA video is all about. So that's going to allow it to tap into that. Not very much space. Cool. And Mesa Utils is like basically OpenGL for Linux, or at least the utilities and the software end of it. So now that those are installed, for one thing, I'll do sudo. Let's do a df... Well, hold on. Let me start over. Do a clear. Now I'm going to do a DF minus H, which is going to show us the disk usage. So you can see right here, we have uh, that SDA1 device. This is the only one we probably really care about. It's a virtual size of 16 gigs. It's used 3.3 gigs. So theoretically, it has 12 gigs available. Only 22, not even a quarter of it used, which is nice. And then I'm going to run uh, Pac-Man minus scc that command i showed you earlier in that little list to clean out the cache files can't perform it unless you're a root this gives me a good opportunity to show you this trick if you type sudo space bang bang exclamation point exclamation point enter it will run the last command sudo so that happens all the time so that's good to know do you want to remove all files from the cache why yes uh you want to remove unused repositories yes Okay, now let's do a DF minus H. You can see we had 3.3 gigs used. 2.6 gigs. Wow. So what's that? Like 700 megabytes? Like a whole CD-ROM worth of stuff. So now we're only using 18% of the drive. 13 gigs free. Cool. So when it expanded that on our host system, uh... If we were to go look at the usage, I guess you wouldn't be able to tell on mine. But it, the file size, it's still going to be bigger. Oh, I guess we could look at it in here, maybe. I don't know if this updates till we shut down the machine, though. Um, yeah, this, this one's not going to update. We'll look at it when we shut it down in a second. Okay, so where are we at over here? Let's maximize this. So... We've installed this stuff, so I want to go ahead and run these commands without acceleration real quick, just to show you the difference. So I'm copy and pasting, doing all that handy dandy. Just run as a regular user. Okay, so I ran this GLX, and then I grepped out the, all the lines with this case sensitive, OpenGL. And you can see it's Mesa XORG. So Mesa, when you see that, that means software. That That's not hardware accelerated. Um, really good for software accelerated so it says it's compatible i guess this is OpenGL version 4.5 which is pretty modern 
Um, da, 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 da. OpenGL S 3.2. But yeah, this is all software because the vendor string, this OpenGL S vendor strings Mesa XORG, right? So then what we can do is run that other command, GLX gears, and we can see a little bit of 3D in action. And this simple program runs fine with software rendering. And it gives you a frames per second count and all that handy dandy stuff to kind of give you an idea. So it was running at 50. Now it's running at 168, 163. Give it five seconds in between. It's sitting there counting 800. Feet. Let's go full maximization with it. Full screen, even this kind of full screen. And let's let it run for five or 10 seconds and see what it gets for that count and then we'll go back out of those modes and it was still getting 41 frames per second not too bad for software of course the more stuff that it's rendering and animating the likelihood and the more effects especially if it does um, like shading shader effects and stuff like that then all that would probably slow it down dramatically or drastically Okay, so I'm going to close this window with the little X. And that's just to show you that. So now we need to jump back over here and put the horse back in front of the carriage. So it says right-click virtual machine settings display. So we need to shut this down to get to be able to do all that. Log out, shut down. Should shut down pretty quick. Arch and Debian seem to shut down pretty fast for the distros. Okay, and then what we do is right-click settings on that virtual machine. And we'll go to display. We're going to peg this out at 128 megabytes of RAM. Make sure this is on VMS VGA and then click enable 3D. Okay. And we'll shrink this down and double check. 128 check. Da, da, da. All right, we did all that. And uh, the other thing real quick while we're here with the machine powered off. Let's go to settings and just look at the hard drive space utilized. So storage, um, this one, and we can see actual size 3.98 gigabytes. So even though we went down to like 2.6 gigabytes, at one point, you know, when during the install, I think it takes about 500 more megabytes than it was utilizing roughly. I don't know. So at one point, it reached about 4 gigabytes. That's what's saying. So even though we shrunk back down, it's still taking up that much space on the host system. Just so you know. Okay, let's double click this bad boy. And it should start booting up any second now. And then we can run the GLX info one more time on there to see the acceleration. And so things like if you're trying to watch YouTube video with sound and all that kind of stuff, if you did you know, run away and try that before we installed the accelerated stuff, you'd notice that it's like not happening. Like the video stuff is not happening <laughs> through the browser. So this will make it so it is happening. It might kind of like stutter or whatever a little bit at first, but give it 10 or 20 seconds and it should be reasonable enough to watch some stuff especially if it's not full screen probably and otherwise you can dig into the arch wiki which i think i linked right here at the very bottom of this file or you just go to wiki.archlinux.org and you can get out there and just dig in and start having fun because now you know the basics you've got the base install of a system going all that all right And then start X. Did I install the VMware? Yeah, I installed that. So in theory, this should automatically kick in because it has the driver, which X11, that's it's called. It, XF86 stood for X Free86. It was a parallel clone that when xorg's licensing was questionable they decided hey we're going to make a free version of it so a lot of holdover stuff comes from back in that day it's called x x11 xorg x windows the x windowing system it all means the same thing you can see right here i said restart x that means restart the x windowing system all right so there it is let's pop open the terminal 
still kind of catching up with itself since it just started. All right, and then we'll do glx info and then pipe that to the grep command and find all the lines with open gl case sensitive. Nothing. Whoa, that's weird. Hmm. I do feel like I'm missing a step somewhere. GLX, that's really weird that it didn't do anything. Um, I've never seen that happen. Let's just do GLX info by itself. Okay, let's do the one with grep. Did I open, open GL? It's case sensitive. I did a lowercase L instead of an uppercase L. Okay, there we go. Now you can see the vendor string is VMware. So that's cool. That's what's up. All right. And now we can run that GLX gears. And let's see if we get better speed out of that now. Well, huh? 51 frames per second wasn't, I think that was about what we were getting last time. 60 frames a second. It's hovering around, maybe it's pegged at 60. I don't know. I think it goes faster than that. I think it can anyway. Let's go full screen. Let that run for a second. And back out of the full screen. All right, yeah, it's staying right around 60 frames per second. So that's not bad. But wasn't it? I felt like it, I thought it was getting bigger. I guess it, so that's about the same. The place you're gonna notice the difference straight up is in Firefox or Chromium watching YouTube videos. That will be your guaranteed noticeable difference. So that covers that part. And we know it's installed because I ran that GLX info and we saw the vendor was the uh, not Mesa. So it's not software, it is hardware as, or as much as it can be hardware. And then what we can do now is go back for this color. So it's nano bash RC, that dosh bash RC. Um, we can just click on this little PC file manager thing and make sure that show hidden under the views on and then you can just the bash rc i'm going to right click let's see if it opens with leafpad automatically yeah in debian it doesn't automatically open with the notepad you have to tell it to okay so you can see it's got this alias ls color auto and that's what at the command prompt that's what gave us those color folder the blue folder listings and now we want to go ahead and add to that and we want to add these other aliases in there and this export so we'll copy that and I'm going to go ahead and open the command prompt before we do this. So I can just right click this command prompt, add to desktop, and then it's added right there. So I don't have to dig for it. Any of the popular programs you like in there, you can do that. Okay. And now if I type LS, I'll just type LS. Okay. You can see that desktop folder is blue. So we know we at least have that. Um, minus ALH, LS minus one minus ALH will show all files in the folder. So we can see all of those. Is there anything in here that might be long? I don't know. I'll, I'm just gonna try and wrap it up. Okay, so I can double check that I got this. Okay, I got that. Come over here. I'm just gonna add it to the very bottom. Add a blank space and then control V to paste it. So this is going to make it so diff defaults to color if you use that. Grep will default to color, which is handy. Um, we don't need this LS color auto because that's already in there. I'll get rid of that in that gist too. IP, so if we use, I don't even know for sure if we have IP, do we? Yeah, IP link. Okay, so that's what that stuff looks like. And then less. So the thing with less is if we do like a um, ls forward slash user um, forward slash bin, then there's a bunch of files and you can see it lists them all in color. So the executables are the green and I believe the blue is folders or maybe those are links. Maybe they're not quite blue. Okay, but if we were to do this and pipe it to less, then it goes to black and white. So let's see if this command actually works 
Let's close this out. I'm going to click the X here. Do I want to save it? Yes. Okay. Now let's reopen the terminal. This should now... LS is still color, so uh, LS forward slash user forward slash bin, USR bin. And then I'm going to pipe that to less. Oh, it looks like it's still in black and white. Okay, that one was a questionable one anyway. But um, like if we did grep, I can't think. I really need to use the restroom, and you're probably over watching this video. So anyway, those are ones I haven't tested out. I just pulled those right off of the official Arch Wiki. And... I'll put a link, like I said, to this, and by the time you get there, it'll probably be slightly updated. If I find anything cool worth adding, I'll add it down towards the bottom of the file somewhere. But that's that. That's how you get that accelerated base install of Arch Linux in a VirtualBox virtual machine. Thanks for watching.